The sport of off-road racing is full of incredible stories, wild characters, legends, and even villains. We cover it all on offroadracer.com, but there's only so much we can put down in an article. Sometimes we have to dig a little deeper, and that means sitting down with some of our industry's most influential characters and hitting record. Welcome to the Off-Road Racer Podcast, a Mad Media production, made exclusively for offroadracer.com. Each month, we'll go beyond the dirt into the homes, shops, and lives of the most interesting and game-changing icons of our sport. You'll hear about their history, success, failure, and everything in between as we pull back the curtain and reveal the stories of their lives. I'm your host, Matt Martelli, and this is the Off-Road Racer Podcast. I'm Matt Martelli. This is the Off-Road Racer Podcast, and I'm here with multi-time off-road champion, Justin Lofton. Yep, thanks for having me, and uh, excited to uh, finally be able to make it all work. I know we've been trying for the last couple weeks, and uh, here we are. Well, you're a busy man. (laughs) You're having kids, you know, family man, businessman, racer. So, you know, talk about, like, we were just talking about life a little bit. Like, you you seem like you're in a pretty good space with your business and family. Yeah, definitely. Uh, You know, it it takes a lot to uh, make it all happen, and we just happen to be here in Las Vegas at the same time. And uh, I'm here for a horse show with my wife and my sisters and a karate tournament for my son, Liam. So it uh, it's kind of cool how it all works out. And you know, it's just a lot of balance. They're uh, they're getting ready to go do their thing this morning. I'm here with you, and uh, yeah, can't complain. Uh, life's pretty good right now. Nice. Yeah, I think it's really cool. Like we we're we we're talking before about the fact that you put your son in karate at five years old. I, I think that's just going to pay dividends. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I did actually taekwondo when I was back in North Carolina myself, and uh, did it for about a year and a half. And and I really it it teaches discipline and, uh, you know, confidence and everything it takes to, you know, have not only a successful racing career, but a successful business and, uh, you know, just overall be happy in life and, uh, you know, explore new opportunities when, when they're, uh, they come available. Yeah, it definitely is teaches you, uh, you know, not, not just discipline, but you know, the way to live, right. It's, it's pretty cool, but it's, I'm, I'm really stoked that you're, uh, you, you put your son on that, that path and that journey at five years old. Has he been doing any, uh, any off-roading and any trophy carts at this point? <laughs> yeah. Um, not necessarily trophy carts or razor one seventies, but I mean, even starting at the age of two, I would take a car seat and strap it into the seat of my razor and we'd go out with our friends to Glamis. And uh, so at a, two years old, he was in the razor with me going to Oldsmobile, going to out to the swing set and uh, all around the sand dunes. And then I put, you know, we'll take the car seat out. I'll put it in one of our pre runners. And uh, his favorite is the Bronco, which uh, we just sold and moved on to a new owner. So I uh, hope they uh, get to enjoy a lot of memories in it. But uh, we did recently purchase a couple go karts. So he's, he has started go kart racing, uh, dirt oval racing in March. And we've done four races so far and uh, super excited about that. There's an awesome community that is, uh, you know, building there and gaining momentum. We've got Velasco's out there and Delaney's and uh, just to name a few uh, other families that have are in the off-road world that have five and six year olds that are racing go-karts together. So, And that's out in Imperial? We're racing in Campo right now up at Camp Lockett. Uh, we'll venture over to Paris Speedway here uh, later in the summer, and then hopefully uh, the Imperial Valley Fairgrounds will be doing races this winter. So hopefully we're racing a couple times a month and, uh, you know, looking forward to seeing where that takes him as well. Yeah, that I, we were talking about that <clears throat> on one of the other podcasts about how cool it is that now we have youth racing. So we have the, these generations now, and the, the really the first wave is just hit with a – Mitch Guthrie's and R.J. Anderson's and, you know, that generation of, of kids. And, you know, now, like you said, you know, it's like we're breeding them. <laughs> yeah, you can, uh, you can definitely see the difference and just the progression level and the age of when they're stepping into full, you know, top level um, classes like unlimited trucks and, and even the unlimited UTV classes and all that. When I was that age, there was nothing that fit me. There right. was a lot of things. I mean, I remember getting in my grandpa's class 11 uh, car, and we were I was literally sitting on a San Diego phone book with an L.A. County phone book behind me with two-by-fours on all the pedals so I could reach, and I'd go bounce around, and, and that was about 
the best you can make something fit when I was that age, where now they're purpose-built race cars with purpose-built you know, built series for them. And it's, uh, it's going to be really cool to see and, um, you know, just at what level they're at, at what age they're at. So there's definitely a maturity aspect that comes along with it, and that's where we hope putting in karate and doing a lot of team sports and everything, we can help that maturity level progress with his ability behind the wheel. Sure. No, that's right. Yeah. I, I love it because it's like, you know, obviously I know your family, I know your dad and, you know, he got you into off-roading at a very young age. And then, you know, and then you went and raced, you know, pavement and, and, uh, you know, had some really good success there too. But, uh, you know, it's really cool to see you sharing that with your son. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a lot of fun. And I've been, now I've been racing over half my life and I'm only 37 years old. So I, and and these kids are getting to start even earlier than that. I remember uh, one trip I was at Bondurant, and this kid, Joey Logano, showed up. Right. And I was racing trucks at Phoenix, and uh, I think he was making maybe making his Xfinity debut. And he's a few years younger than me. And I started putting it together at what age he started racing and what age I started racing and where we were at. And he, would, he was always going to have, like, eight years on me right. just because he got to start so young. It's like... So at you know at a certain point, I told uh, my wife, I was like, if Liam is gonna race, we've got to start now. It yeah. doesn't necessarily have to be at any kind of <clears throat> full committed level. It's just right. we got to start the you know we got to start it. And uh, so here we are, and uh, it's cool that we get a race racing the go karts right now. That dad gets to have one too. So <laughs> we uh, dad had to go get a one twenty five cc cart, and nice. you know I'll be able to race with him for quite a few years, or at least at the same event. So. Uh, really looking forward to that and looking forward to, you know, sharing a lot of uh, memories and experiences at the racetrack coming Dude, up. <laughs> this is, I, I want to go because I want to see the look on the faces of the locals <laughs> when, when all of a sudden they're like, oh, who's this kid? Oh no, Justin Lofton's here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, it's definitely, it, you know, when you pick a lot of those People don't, or a lot of that group doesn't really pay attention to off-road racing and, and kind of vice versa. So really when you, when we show up, there's a, it, it's, it's, almost, it's very organic because you don't know who their top racer is and they don't know where you come from besides everyone just is like staring each other down with their race suits and like who looks more official right now. Right. So it was a, uh, it was pretty funny actually just a couple of weeks ago, Jarrett Brooks uh, is racing carts too, and he's got his son racing. And so his son and my son race against each other. And then Jarrett and I race against each other and we're out there in our full off road suits and look pretty official. And, and a couple of the local guys come up and like, well, what do you guys do? Yeah. Like, why do you have suits like this? Yeah. And of course we go out and they spank us because they're the locals and it's they their track. It. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun that way. That's really cool. You know, it, it's funny because, you know, off-road racing culture really spawned from East County, for, you know, predominantly from El Cajon, but also, you know, also Imperial because that was where everybody went to off-road in Plaster mm -hmm. City and, and, uh, and Glamis in particular. You know, how rad was that growing up in that? You know, it, it, was, it was really cool, and it, and it gets even radder the older you get and you realize and you see all how the cities keep expanding and what, you know, how confined they are to what we do, where... When I was 13 years old, I used to be able to ride, jump on my dirt bike from my garage, jump on some field roads, cross a couple, you know, highways, and 18 miles later, I was riding in the dunes. Yeah. And uh, we had some friends that lived at the edge of town. We'd fill our dirt bikes up. We'd go out. We'd ride. We'd fill our dirt bikes up. We'd ride home. Right. And uh, there's not very many places left that you get to do that. And, um, you know, very fortunate that we still get to live there, um, you know, even on a on a half time schedule between our time in Texas and California. But even in Texas, we're pretty much out in the middle of nowhere. We have uh, 700 acres out there that when Liam's ready to really start expanding and exploring, I've got plenty of land I can go burn in either a dirt bike track or a go-kart track or a rally track or, you know, whatever he wants to do. So we, uh, we're definitely going to capitalize on what, on, you know, what we have to offer for them and, uh, you know, help them grow. It's funny because, you know, like obviously Imperial has a lot of farming, right. And, uh, um, you know, as a kid being born in the Midwest, my first experience of pitching a car sideways was on farm roads in Michigan. Right. And it was a, a friend of the family who had just gotten his, you know, his, his hot rod car. Right. And, you know, was like, Hey, you should drive. I think it was like, 
10 or 11 right and um it was a it was i remember it really clearly it was a nova right and he i remember sitting in the passenger seat and he slid the car and i was like whoa that's <laughs> crazy right and now i look at it as like this tiny little slide yeah. right but uh i think there's something to that of you know of farm roads you know uh, I was hanging out with some of the, the the world rally guys that I know, Petter Salberg and whatnot, and they were talking about that about like, you know, all these kids that you know end up going into all these different forms of racing. Like they grew up on farms, mm-hmm. right? And so they're rallying the shit out of these <laughs> roads and whatever vehicle they have, you know, at the at a very young age. And I think that's part of the ingredient why you see so many young drivers come out of that that region, and they're they're amazing, you know, because they've been, you know, sliding cars around since they were kids. Yeah. And, and a couple of things can spawn off and we could, you know, um, we get to drive a lot of different pieces of equipment very yeah. early on. And, and even right now, when I go out there, I set Liam on my lap and we go out and we drive a road grader and we might only be going three and a half miles an hour, but you wouldn't believe how tough it is to drive at three and a half miles an hour. Um, in high school, I was working for a farmer and it was the same thing. Like we'd go up and down the rows, either making beds or, or cutting hay or something like that. And you're going six miles an hour, but you want those rows straight because the balers behind you need to be able to go straight. Sure. And, uh, so it, it really teaches you to pay attention and, and focus. So I think there's a group that we get a, we all get experience really early on driving a lot of different pieces of equipment and getting just drive really early in life. Versus then the ones that are like, you know what? I grew up on the farm and I don't want to go back to the farm, so I better be good at something else. <laughs> sure. And, uh, you know, there was a little bit of that in me um, out of high school and why I went pavement racing was, uh, you know, my dad wasn't really pushing me hard to get in the cattle industry at that point. And uh, really the only other option, I wasn't very studious. I didn't I didn't really care to sit down in a classroom and learn. I wanted to you be out and be both, physical. Right. So I was like, my option was either to go sit on a tractor and be a farmer or go be a race car driver. And so I put a lot of effort in being a race car driver because I didn't want to be a farmer at that time. So Well, it seems uh, pretty logical to me, yeah, right? Yeah, 18, 19 years old, there's a lot more to life to offer than oh. sitting behind a tractor. Yeah, all the girls are at the racetrack. Exactly, right? <laughs> exactly. No, that's, that's interesting, and uh, uh, that makes a lot of sense. You know, what, you know, as you were coming up and getting into pavement racing, I mean – where was your head at where you're like, Hey, I want to do this full time. Like I can do this. Cause like, I remember watching you go through that process. I'm like, man, he's going into the deep end of the pool. (laughs) You know, I'm not sure, you know, cause I'd seen Eichler go in and, and struggle with the politics and the finances of it. He definitely had the talent, but it was just like, you know, one day it was like, you're on the team. Okay, cool. Everything's good. And then it's like, some political thing happened, you're off the team. Yeah. Had nothing to do with his ability to drive. And I remember talking to his dad about it and his dad was like, I'm like, Oh, you know, what a bummer, you know, but I'm sure it'll be all right. And he goes, no, I think we're, I think it's done. And I'm like, what? You know what, I mean? <laughs> what do you mean? Yeah. And then that's how it was. We had a really, really good run. And, and unfortunately, Brian and I moved back at the same time. We actually raced out of the same late model, um, shop out of uh, Lancaster's with the Copenhavers, and he was racing a super late model. I was racing a late model. We went Winston West racing together, and then we basically moved back to North Carolina within a month of each other, and um, and both went ARCA racing. And you know, we both had really good runs. We I had a really good run going, and it just it just happened to be in that 08, 09, 2010, 2011 time frame when the economy started getting really tough. We were yeah. really feeling the effects of the housing market. Um, Teams were drying up, seats were drying up, and then there was a whole class of NASCAR um, family coming up with Chase Elliott, Ryan Blaney, uh, Burtons, and you, and the list goes on and on. So the seats that we were all kind of going to be fighting for they were, were already gonna, filled. Yeah, there was no we we could have gone out there and beat them, but my name wasn't Elliott or Blaney or right. Burton. So they were, those seats were going to get taken. And, and I kind of ran in the same thing. I had a really good thing going with Eddie Sharp racing, um, 2000 into 2012, 2013 seat, uh, part of the team was sold. And then at the end of 13 and I ran a partial schedule then, and, uh, things were, you know, I was trying to get back in full time. Things were looking good that, you know, was going to happen full time again. And then that team folded. 
Yeah. And it was so late into the year when they start talking about silly season in August, like you got to have your seat figured out in July, August, September, because if you wait till January, well, Daytona is only four weeks away. Right. And uh, so everything's figured out there. And unfortunately, it happened really late in into that year, or early into the next year. And I was left without a ride for a year. Sure. And at that point, I was I had a graphic design business, vinyl business back there, and it kind of kept me busy along with the production uh, business, Weekend Warriors, with uh, my friend Brett and my sister. And so we stayed busy in uh, 2015, and it's crazy. On my way over here was actually on Facebook Memories was a picture of my last race nine years ago wow. in truck. And uh, so 2015, I got a call um, to put to, to out, just basically go out and do a test. Actually, I think it was 14, um, to go out and do a test. And I ended up getting a... It was supposed to be a 10 race deal. Same thing. Uh, did five races. Things got political. And next thing you know, the week, like the Monday I was supposed to be coming out to Vegas, I, you know, called the team and I was like, hey, I haven't got my flight itinerary, hotels, what's the deal? And they're like, oh, no, you're not driving the truck anymore. Oh, nice. Like, what, what do you mean? You know, so basically at that point, you know, called up my family, called up my dad. And my dad's like, I think it's time to come home. And so basically January of 2015 is when I moved back to California and, and uh, kind of set, you know, set sail on that, on that dream for a minute. And uh, it, took a, it, it took a couple of years to go through it. But in the meantime, we had built the Jimco Trophy truck. We had yeah. built Badco. We had won the Mint. We were going back, you know, getting ready. I won the Mint again later that year um, or the following year in 2016. So it kind of kept my mind occupied that way. Uh, got married to my wife, Lisa, and, uh, you know, kind of started the next phase of my life. And, uh, you know, here we are today. So Mitch, why is this bike so drippy? It's our 23 race bike. We can start up front, work our way to the back. Bones can tell you about the suspension. The rear shock is one of the most critical parts of the bike. Pegs with the titanium mounts. Kashima coating here. And a gravity lightweight battery. Young's modulus. Horse and a half. Works, Works chassis lab. More tie than a space shuttle. Really? I might need that repeated. This thing slaps. Slaps. Oh, you should have told me that earlier. Yeah, it's a, it's a funny like, like push pull relationship that off road has with, you know, with really with cup racing, right? With Jimmy going mm -hmm. and, and be, having his success, and then, you know, some some of the other guys where, you know, there there's this connective tissue. But like you were saying, it's I think that the 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 political families that you know control NASCAR, I think that's probably why they're having all the problems that they are with the not appealing to spectators, right? And this is me just going out on a limb of like, you know, I think there's not enough diversity. And when I say diversity, I don't mean like necessarily ethnic diversity. I just mean characters. Mm -hmm. It's like all those dudes look the same. They say the mm -hmm. same things. You know, they have the same accent. You know, there's, there's like very little differentiation between them, you know, and, and then when you try and, get them or try and figure out what, what is their personality? It's like vanilla. Yeah. And a lot of them, you know, a lot of them actually do have really big personalities and they're, and they're, a lot of them are really cool. They've grown up racing so that they've, you know, they're definitely, their, their box has been built that way. And even when I was, um, you know, NASCAR racing, we got, we were told to stay in a certain box. Sure. Um, and because there was a risk of sponsors, not liking you, the, organization not liking you your fellow competitors not liking you and and obviously we're all really more worried about sponsors not liking us or, or sure. attracting to us so you can go out on a really big limb and try to go to the far you know far outside of it and then try to bring in some um you know some out of the ballpark sponsor that probably wouldn't have been um wouldn't have been interested in the sport and and i could you know one guy today that is doing that is noah gregson right um you know he really definitely you know, I, I'd say taking a chance with his personality and not being in that box, but he obviously has some financial security behind him that allows him to do that. And if it tracks someone, it does. And if it doesn't, he's still in the seat. So, uh, there's definitely, uh, you know, some comfort areas on different people, but a lot of it is the guys, when they start racing, they start at a very early age and, and even early on in life, they might say they're from California, but you look at what age did they move to Indianapolis right. or North Carolina? Yeah. I mean, we're already, 
looking at that ourselves. Like, okay, if Liam's going to go racing, I'm already looking at houses in Charlotte. Right. And it might be five years from now, but we're, you know, you know, starting sure. to make that play. But, uh, but yeah, going back to it, I mean, you look back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, Harry Gant got, you know, he was a farmer out in California and he got the call at 30 something years old and like, hey, why don't you come back and drive the skull car? Right. So those guys were allowed to have personality. And, and I wouldn't say allowed to have personality. They just did because they were that, regular people. And that to me was their golden era. I mean, you yeah. looked at those guys and you were like, hey, I relate to this guy. He's like my uncle or my, like, you know, and he's probably going to say some wild shit that's yeah. off color, right? But like, that's who. That's who America is. Yep. You know what I mean? Like, I understand the, like, hey, we've got to manage, you know, stuff and not be, you know, so abrasive that we're turning people off or, you know, offending people per se. But, like, man, it's it's got so vanilla <laughs> now. And the, the combination of that and, like, the, the over-regulation, I think, and, you know, obviously we're biased because we're, we're really the only form of unlimited racing, you know, in the world, right? Yeah. And we're the Cowboys, right? And and as the promoter, it's like, you know, I want, you know, more diversity. I want more characters. I don't want, you know, the character set that we have to just be all like these, you know, <clears throat> these, you know, kids that grew up in Southern California, blonde hair, blue eye, whatever, whatever yep. the stereotype yeah, whatever it is. is. Yeah. You know, um, that was one thing we learned in skateboarding that I think really blew skateboarding up is that, you know, there's a guy that you know, was somewhat of a, a mentor, Steve Rocco, and he had World Industries. Mm -hmm. And he was like the first guy to take a black skateboarder and be like, here's your company. Like, this kid is badass. He's got rad style, you know, and there's a lot of black kids in America yeah. that that he appeals to. And even even white kids looked at him and was like, this this guy, like, he's more he's like, good. A, he's, he, yeah. he acts more like a rapper than he does a skateboarder, right? <laughs> and that had a you know, a, a appeal to a specific audience. And then Steve did, Steve Rocco did it. He's like, Oh, here's this hippie kid. And here's this punk rock kid. And he just built these companies stylistic around these different characters. And it, it, it totally worked. Right. Because it expanded the appeal of skateboarding. Mm -hmm. You know, prior to that, you look at skateboarding and it was all blonde hair, blue eyed kids, right? Southern California yeah, beach it, kids. Yeah. You're like, even I remember even arriving and kind of like going like, I don't look like any of these guys, right? <laughs> I'm not sure I'm allowed to be here or whatever. And yeah. there's definitely some fist fights, right? Yeah. But but you know that's that's the thing is I think that you know our form of racing embraces that that wildness and that diversity versus you know and, it, and that truthfully that may cost some sponsors. Like there may be some sponsors out there who are like. You guys are too wild for us, you know. Yeah, a little bit, or just not <clears throat> understanding, or how to, or how to grasp onto it. And going back to it, it's really it looking at racing across the world. I mean, it's pretty cool that when you tell someone you drive an unlimited truck, they're like, "Well, what do you mean?" Like, literally, it's what do you want? You want two turbos? You want four turbos? You want no turbos? You want it's all wheel drive, two wheel drive? Yeah, you know what I, mean? I mean, it's it's uh it's pretty crazy. I woke up this morning, I was watching Formula One qualifying, and and Basically, besides a whole lot of money that's spent on a belly pan, the cars are all the same. Yeah. And it really comes down to who can, you know, put it together. And, and that has its own challenges, uh, per se, when it comes to strategy and everything like that. But being able to say, yeah, I run a 40-inch tall tire, big Fox shocks, big, you know, big method wheels, Brembo brakes. I have 500-something cubic inch behind me, and I, I'll go 160 miles an hour across the desert. They're like, what are you talking about? Yeah. And they just can't even fathom it yeah and uh so it's pretty cool that um you know we get to do that and uh, you know i'm fortunate I, i'm very fortunate that i get to be one of the top guys doing it yeah no I, absolutely i mean but the it's interesting you know bringing up for anyone because I, I i'm i'm loving you know what's going on right now between <clears throat> the drive to survive series mm -hmm. and then you know, uh, them pushing into Las Vegas. I mean, the stuff that they're doing here is just, it's badass. Yeah. You know, and it, it's, it's actually, it's helping us because, you know, they're pushing the ceiling financially so far beyond what we've ever seen in America. I'm just standing there going, Hey, we're the cheap day. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. You know, like, we'll still give you a good time. <laughs> yeah. Hey, exactly. <laughs> like you can take the catering budget and that'll cover us for the year. You yeah. know? Um, but it, it's also really cool. You know, I enjoy, you know, going to the other 
motorsports events and seeing how they're executing things and you know and talking about them i mean dude the i saw the numbers uh two days ago uh from a you know a, a group that measures all the events biggest event in america to date this year was indy really yeah. yeah and not by like a not by like a little by a lot bigger than the super bowl huh. right so i'm like oh man like that really tells you where our head's at in america right so it's going to be interesting to see how F1 fleshes out over the next few years. But one thing that I've already kind of like identified is that, I, you know, don't get me wrong. I respect all the drivers, but like, man, I, I can't relate to Verstappen. You know what I mean? <laughs> he's a race car. He's a robot. Yeah. He's a, he's a race car driver. But like the, the, the whole thing, I'm like, like I'm, and I think a lot of America's like that of like, okay, that's, that's the dude. But like, He's not like us. Yeah. You know what I mean? Whereas you, I look at you as a character and I go, oh, this is such a great story. It's like, you know, a kid from Imperial from Imperial County. And for people who don't know where Imperial County is, it's east of San Diego. Uh, it's a huge agricultural area, but it's also desert, right? So we had, you know, Plaster City is one of the major testing areas mm -hmm. and had all the old school races with FUD and um, just a big culture there of off-roading and then glamis yep and glamis is like you know for america is one of the most important meccas of off-roading of, of in particular duning and you know we went there you know during the winter it was like every other weekend yep. you know especially the big holiday weekends and you have you know now probably three generations of people who have grown up going there and and it's a culture, you know. Yeah, I, I was sure. telling somebody the other day. It's like <clears throat> I have friends that have three hundred thousand dollars sand cars, but they don't own a house, <laughs> right? That's just the culture, yeah. you know. Because you know they they work construction, and then but they're not. If you ask them, you know, they're not construction workers. They're who they are on the weekend in their sand yeah. car. Yeah, they're exactly. like I'm I'm Comp Hill Bob or whatever, yeah. right? <laughs> Yeah, you know, like, I, oh, okay. I work to make my sand car, and that's what you know. That's what it is, and and uh, Glamis is awesome. I I'm a big fan of the dunes, and I don't make it out there for living twenty minutes away. I don't make it out there anywhere near as much as I should, but it's definitely been a very um, important foundation and building block of my racing career. Because where else do you go that you're going down the side of a mountain or hill or whatever you want to call them out there? the sand is moving. So you're going like this, but you're pointed up right? and it's about the most uncomfortable feeling that you can possibly get, but it comes into play when you guys run us up beer bottle pass or, you know, out down in Baja when oh, yeah. we're going across mics or anything like that, because you're used to being uncomfortable. Yeah. And, uh, so you look at something like that, you're like, yeah, you go over there and everyone's looking at, you know, how to get up the mountain on this side. And you're like, no, let's just go up and around this way. Oh, it definitely teaches you lines, right? Yep. Like, like there's an interesting thing that that happens in off road where you, you know reading terrain, but it's like this almost like it's almost like the ultimate geography lesson because mm -hmm. now wherever I go, I like I look at the mountains and look at the way that the mountain shapes down, and I I could tell you what that's going to be like. Yep. And the closer you are to the mountain, the rougher it's going to be. The more you're going to get caught by all these fingers coming down. You know, that's where the water settles. All these things that, like, you just learn after years and years of doing it. But I think duning definitely teaches you, you know, how to read terrain and, and uh, you know, and read lines. You know, it's it's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. And, and uh, you know, watching out for the witch's eyes and, and the big cliffs on the other side. And, um, and you know, the most important thing in our, our rule is, when we'd go out as kids in high school, we basically lived out there every weekend and, uh, you know, but we all drove two wheel drive trucks right? and we weren't out there in four wheel drive trucks. We were out there in two wheel drive trucks and you learned not to get stuck because yep. no one was like, our rule was your friend. Only the people in the truck was allowed to get you unstuck. There was no tow ropes. There was no nothing. <laughs> I like that. And, uh, so, you know, I've learned a lot and, and unfortunately, when you're out pre-running in, you know, a 7,000 pound truck or whatever, you're going to get stuck a lot sure. because you're just out cruising around. So that doesn't, you know, it, it's just something that's always been a part of me. It's like, oh, hey, we're stuck in this wash or don't stop right here because it's going to be soft. You need to drive over here where the rocks are or like I need to get one tire up on this one rock in this wash because the guy in the backseat's puking his brains out on you <laughs> or something. So, 
yeah, it's, uh, you know, been, been very, very fortunate. Even though I started racing later in life, just growing up out and around it, I'm sure. very comfortable in the desert and, um, you know, and able to read terrain and do what I need to do out there to go fast. Yeah. No, that's right. Racing against your dad is something that 90% of the racers in the world will never get. I've accomplished everything I wanted to do, and now he's just like taking the reins. I want to be remembered for being a, a, a huge part of short course, not just racing, keeping it alive, helping it grow. If it comes down to the last weekend and I'm in it, the boys better watch out. <laughs> You know, you know, talking about your career in off-road racing, obviously you're the you're the guy who has the most wins at the Ball One Thousand. I'm sorry, at the Mint Four Hundred, um, but you haven't got that Ball One Thousand win. I know it's. Uh, what are we doing? Yeah, uh, it's. You know, I, I'm actually relatively new to Baja racing versus the guys I'm racing against, and uh, I think I've only ran the Baja One Thousand four or five times. Yeah, um, it's just putting it together, and every time we go down there, we learn something new and. And, uh, you know, Ray Griffith and I, for the last couple of years, have, have really been trying at it. And uh, I messed up our, our probably our best shot at it to date in 2019, um, just running hard and clipped a rock on the side of a mountain and, and uh, broke a power steering pump and or broke the box, actually, in, in one of the two-wheel drive trucks. And, you know, I learned an important lesson there because I slept on the side of a mountain when the ground was frozen and, and, uh, it's cold. You know, it was cold. Yeah, it was cold. It was the last time I wanted to do that. And, uh, 2020, I ran with Mario Fuentes in the class one car. We ended up finishing third in that. And if I had just had a little bit more information, I think we probably could have at least pulled a second off, maybe even the win just didn't know where we are throughout the race. But yeah. When you're racing against the, on the unlimited trucks and you're racing against unlimited budgets of, you know, Menzies and McMillans and, and just the sheer experience that, that they have down there, it makes it pretty, it makes it really, really tough. But I don't think uh, it's very far away for us to get a Baja 1000 win or a Baja win in general. And, um, you know, I definitely need one or two or three or four before, you know, I, uh, I hang up my hat and, you know, for well, retirement, but we you, got quite a few years. I left. mean, look at, look at Raglan and Rossler, right? It's like, I was making a joke earlier of like, you know, I told, you know, I had Larry on, you know, a few podcasts ago and, uh, uh, Larry Rossler and I'm like, you know, how do you feel? And he goes, I feel great. And I, and I didn't want to be like, well, when is the end date? Right. <laughs> but he's like, I feel great. I, I got a few more years left in me and then, yep. and then we'll see. And I'm like, you know, Okay, I go, and then we'll pump you with stem cells, and we'll yep. get five we'll get more going. years, right? Yeah. So no, it's really cool. It's one of the things that that's interesting about our sport in particular is that it kind of favors, you know, older drivers, mm -hmm. you know, because of of how much, you know, racecraft and you know how much of it's mental, you know. Oh yeah, I mean, look at Larry. He goes out there, and he's in a truck that's fourteen, fifteen years old, that really isn't anywhere near what we're driving and he's pulling off seconds and thirds every race because he, we all he go won. out there he won yeah. a 500 right? yeah a couple of years ago and, <clears throat> and uh yeah because we're out there driving and it's it's a it's an interesting balance and when you when you leave the start line of a baja race now and, and really any off-road race you make the choice like 10 years ago it used to be an attrition deal like don't wear your stuff out like you, it's the guy who controls his pace. Now there's so many good trucks that when you leave the start line, you make the decision that I'm either going to win or I'm going to break. Right. And that's really what it is. And, and a lot of us end up finishing, but we drove the entire time up to that point that our truck failed us to win the race right. with no irregard of, I want to run second. I want to run third. I want to run right. fourth. So, you know, Larry, and that's where, you know, the, uh, the experience of a uh, Larry Rossler, uh, Rob McCachron come into sure. play because they're like, I can run hard enough that I need two trucks to break, not right. four trucks. I need two trucks to break. And then I'm right there. Yeah. And, uh, and, and it shows where they're at, where yeah. us younger ones are like, I got to run as hard as Bryce, Luke, Tavo, yeah. Allen. And so we put ourselves up in that and, and, um, you know, those guys now aren't breaking anymore, though. No, I mean, it's two crazy. of them are not breaking. It, it's the the pace. I'm, I keep going like we, 
the pace is so gnarly. And not just it, actually, it's funny because we were talking about this th- the other day of like in in it's not just in trophy trucks. It's in sixty one hundred. It's in UTVs. Mm-hmm. Like it's in ten. You know, like I, I always sit at pits. I'm like, you know, like Brock Hager came flying through, and I'm like. That's it's not going to live. That's not going to live. And it's a UTV. It yeah. just, that's, you, you're driving it beyond the limits, and it did. Yeah. Right? And I'm like, oh, damn. He just pushed the envelope. He didn't win by a few seconds. He won by a lot. Yeah. You know? And, um, you know, it's it's just really interesting. And obviously, the evolution to four-wheel drive. And I was really glad to see you make that transition because there, was, there began a separation in equipment where, like, if you had – you know, four wheel drive, especially in Baja, that's where they really thrive. You know, that zero to 30 acceleration, yeah. zero to 60 acceleration, the corner to corner battle. You know, it's like, it's, a, it's you can't compete. No, it's in having ridden in, I've ridden in two of them. And, you know, it's like the acceleration is just incredible. It, it's, yeah. it's beautiful. Yeah, I've been since I've been driving Steve Oligus's truck, the other Fox truck, the last couple of races at the 500. We were having we were having a good day and we were um we had the it the mindset of we're going for top 5s. And uh you know, unfortunately we missed it by, you know, one position and uh at the Baja 500, but Luke got around me. He was having a bad day and he got around me and I was like, "Okay, like, here's my chance. Like, let's follow Luke and let's see what the pace is. Yeah. It, within like three miles, he was, he had three minutes on me yeah. just because he, we would pull up to a danger and, you know, he, it was one that he would literally park the truck, drive through the hole, get back up, get on the gas and he was gone. And, and I had Derek uh, riding with me and it's like, Derek, I was like, hold on because we for get, us to stay in his dust, we got to keep we gotta go and just, yeah. Boom, belly up, you know, belly pan off the bottom of the truck. We're flying through the air, and the entire time it's like can't lift because yeah. when it comes down, we need all the bite. We, you know, we need all the forward momentum we can get. We go on the next one, and there's some, you know, some whoops. And I, I'm up there watching Luke just kind of drive through them, just as smooth as can be. And I'm like, here's my chance. I got to go. Stand on the gas. And boom, 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 boom. Truck going through it. And I'm like, it, it the two wheel drive truck's not going to live trying to keep up with that. Right. And he's out, and he's literally just out cruising. Yeah. And uh, so you really, really see the difference. I mean, we have Best in Desert, uh, Vegas to Reno coming up. That yeah. race is going to be 77 mile an hour average probably. Yeah. And uh, for 500 miles. And, you know, there's a few of us that are showing up with them, and we're probably not going to break and run that kind of pace. So yeah, it's it, crazy. It, that, that one's interesting too, though, because, you know, you, you, still have the, you still have the Herbst trucks out there that have the highest top speed at around 160. Yep. And what we saw is like, was it last year, two years ago when our Sierra won? Uh, last year. Yeah, so it was yep. last year, and it was like, oh, Bryce crosses the finish line, <laughs> yeah. and they're like popping champagne, and it was like... No, here comes our Ryan. Is that is that our Sierra? Oh, shit. Yeah. Right? And a two-wheel drive, right? And, and, and Ryan's unique in that because he's comfortable driving at those high speeds. Not everybody is, right? Yep. So, you know, in that particular, with him in that particular vehicle, it's like, you know, he's yeah. able to reel some of that time back. Yeah, uh, yeah. Ryan definitely had a really he had an advantage on Bryce and I last year. Um, that, that's we were, right. Okay, so now I'm remembering the battles between you and Bryce. That it was, was awesome, epic. Yeah, right? it was so much fun because we were both unfortunately having to manage tires. Yeah, and uh, and then Vegas Torino is very unique because it really favors the person that starts farther back that um, that gets the swept road and then catches that air brake. You know, unfortunately, one of our competitors behind us decided to double flat really early on. And, and I knew at the start line, I was like, I need everyone needs to stay in line to a certain point of the race because Bryce and I can do our thing. And when you go at Vegas Torino, the roads are still they got that little tiny grainy, yeah. um, you know, cover on them. They're slippery. And Bryce and I and the all wheel drive trucks kind of had, you know, we were able to to manage that. But when you get down into certain areas in the washes, there's no path in front of you. You're looking, literally looking for the signs. It's what Baja used to be. Right. And uh, so we're kind of picking our way through where if you start 6th, 7th, 8th, ninth, now there's a burnt-in trail. Sure. And I know there was washes that, you know, Bryce went left and I went right. And we're, like, both kind of, like, crisscrossing, going through. But, um, you know, Ryan, yeah, having that 165 miles an hour down, 
you know, down these long roads where Bryce and I are probably running 130, 135. Right. Uh, you know, he can put a lot of time on us. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's it was pretty interesting, and, and the other cool thing was like the Menzies have spent a ton of money uh, on their video and live stream mm-hmm. packages, which have brought things that we've never seen, right? Yep. And you know, I I give them a ton of credit. Um, I appreciate that because they don't have to do that, you know. And it's not the leagues doing that. It's yeah, you know, it's individuals. Steve, it's Steve and Bryce going, "Hey, we're spending all this money racing. Nobody's seeing it. Let's." go ahead and spend some more for the <laughs> helicopter, yeah. for the camera rig, for the camera operator, you know, and then the live stream part of it. Cause now we have some better technology that, you know, we help develop with, you know, the mint and we're only, you know, we're very close to being, to having a package that's going to be in every vehicle and, and you'll have live streaming and, and it will be relatively inexpensive especially compared to what it used to be. So I, yeah. I'm excited about that because it was bitching to be able to see that via Bryce's live feed, Yeah, you know, and it was like, you know, you guys dicing it up, especially going through the one town that you guys went through <laughs> yeah. that you're allowed to go at speed. I'm like, hell yeah, this is, this is off-road racing. This is what it's about. Not these speed zone bullshit things. Yeah. That as promoters, we get stuck with in certain areas, but like, you know, no, it's like, you know, through the town, we, we want to put on a show, you know, and, and, you know, obviously be safe, but you know, you guys are good. Both of you guys are like, have a very high level of, uh, race craft. So, you know, there's some, there's, there is a disparity in, in talent, you know, in off road. So the guys in the back, maybe, you know, take it easy. They don't have the, the level of skills that you guys have, but man, that was so fun and so awesome to watch. Right. Yeah. And then, too, to be honest, like, it was also cool that, you know, the drama of, like, okay, cool, you thought, like, cool, Bra- Bryce has got it. Yeah. Right? And then it's like, oh, wait, no. You know, and that that's one of the things I love about the unpredictability of our sport. It, you know, as a promoter, everybody's like, hey, who do you think is going to win this year? And I'm like, well, you know, Lofton's done it, you know, multiple times. <laughs> I would bet on him, but... You know, there's a rock out there with his name on it, yeah. right? There's a part that's going to fail at some point, yeah. right? Uh, you know, on and on with all the variables, right? And so it's like, I just don't think people understand how hard this is. But I also love the fact that it's like, it changes up, right? And we get the, you know... Surprise the, winners. The, you get the Eric Harden winning yeah, the Mint 400, yeah, which, which is I, awesome. Which I think is really important because, you know, like we were talking about this as it relates to Baja and that, you know, you, you know, you got a lot of guys that look at it and they're like, I can't spend two weeks pre-running. Uh, I don't have the finances to, you know, have this particular type of truck, the spares, the chase crew, you know, in this, this upcoming Baja 1000, I'm actually really excited about it. But from a promoter standpoint, I'm like, man, it's going to be expensive. <laughs> you know, <laughs> oh, whatever, yeah, whatever yeah. teams, uh, you know, it's like, I almost feel like we should be doing like one of those like you know GoFundMe's for all, for all the teams <laughs> like you know like uh, teams that need a little bit of help here's ten grand or whatever yeah. it is uh, just so we see the best racing because like like you were saying like you know you and there's a lot of guys like Ray Griffith I saw him and he had a he had a good race at the 500 mm-hmm. um, that are just killers that just need you know need to be on the team need the opportunity. You know, and they're going to go do well, so. All right, Chase, number 23. It's 2023. This championship's yours. Let's show these guys what's up. Easy, boys. It's not over yet. Big dog still got to eat. <laughs> Whatever you say, big dog. Seriously? These fools think I'm fried? They know the deal. <laughs> Do you, yep. So do you have plans for the thousand? I don't have plans right now for the thousand. Um, it was one race at the beginning of the year because it is <clears> such a big undertaking. And this year, at, at the end of last year, um, I really I I decided I told everyone I was going to take um, you know not really take some time off from off road racing, but scale my operation back. I I had a my race shop was in Indio. I brought it back home. Um, I wasn't really quite sure what that was going to look like. Uh, we're working really hard on a beef brand and my, my direct consumer beef business and going 
pre-running for two weeks for five or six, you know, for four or five races a year, that really adds up to a lot of time. Yeah. Um, we have karate tournaments, wife showing horses, we have go-kart races. So you got a lot going on. Yeah. At that, I just kind of scaled back and I was really, I'm very fortunate in, in that Steve called and was like, Hey, do you want to come race the 250 with me? And he literally called me. It was like Thursday before that race. And right. I was like, yeah, I'd love to. I'll be down there on Tuesday. Right. Like this is, this is my time commitment. This is what I'll allow myself. And uh, he's like, cool. Cause I'm not coming down till then either. Yeah. Like, you know, perfect. This will work. And we went to the 250 and had a good time. And we started talking about the 500 and I was like, I'm in for the 500, but I'm not going down till Tuesday before the race. Right. And he's like, cool. Cause I'm not either. Right. Like perfect. So we're, you know, we're on the same balance there. So, um, and, it, and it's worked out because I've gone down there and I haven't had the stress of having my own truck, my own team down there. So I got to go down and, and you know, be a lot more natural and just go out. And I got yeah, my pre-runner. I got two guys. Yeah. We're going to go pre-run. We'll have and, a good time. And we're going to pre-run I, 10 to 12 hours a day. Yeah. Um, I, th I think that it's also important to do that at some points, right? Like, like it's funny for me because, you know, we're always shooting stuff, right? And we go down there with this mindset of like, okay, we're not going to sleep much. You know, we've, we've got to grind it out and then, uh, you know, and then haul ass home. Right. And so I don't, I, I still enjoy that. Right. But you don't get to stop and smell the flowers. And yeah. then, you know, this year we went down and we're like, we purposely said no to a few clients and, you know, and we focused on doing podcasts and, you know, it's like race day comes around and we're like, well, we're going to go spectate. You <laughs> yeah. know what I mean? So it's it was, easy to get burnt out doing this, yeah. especially when you've been doing it, you know, 18, 19 years I yeah. mean, from when I, when I turned 17 and started racing, I've, I've done everywhere from the, the least amount of races I've done in one year is 12 yeah. and the most I've done in a year is 40 Wow. and everywhere in between the last 18 years of racing, that's been my race schedule. Yeah. Um, you know, COVID hit. And 2020, the world was locked down. We didn't do anything. I somehow ran 10 off-road races right. still. And, and then in the meantime, we still went down to Baja and, and you know, had our, our guys' trips essentially. with a tro And we just took a trophy truck down and we drove around for 700 miles. Right. Um, so even with COVID and what should have been a rest time for us, we were still racing. So it kind of got to a point where when, you know, it started affecting business was like, we got to back it down a little bit and, uh, you know, kind of see what's playing. And obviously as you being a promoter and seeing what is going on in that world out there, it's, there's really is, there was no way to make a plan this year no. for the most part No, in like we, picking races and choosing races. And you couldn't do it because it, it destroyed. I mean, it's, it's weird. We were talking about it the other day and like, like I go through these emotions where I'm like angry, yeah. you know, because now we're finding out like, okay, it did, you know, this whole thing did come from this lab and they lied to us about all these things. Right. And they just destroyed businesses, you mm -hmm. know, and it wasn't just our business, but you know, in the event business. And it was just like, you know, <clears throat> completely illogical stuff. Like, like early on in the, in, in the pandemic, we're part of a group that includes burning man. And we, you know, got with those guys and we're like oh we hired a vir virologist and a, and a specialist in in air you know air quality and they kicked out a report and basically said hey he, if you're standing in the middle of the mojave desert with a bunch of people you can't get this yeah right they didn't care they're like they literally said what is the fire code of prim inside the building that's how many people you can which was like a couple hundred <laughs> and i'm like this uh, is insane what, yeah you know what i mean so whatever, we're, we're through that, but it did, you know, it did kind of put everything into check and, you know, it created a lot of instability and it, we're still dealing with it. I, I, we're just really getting in, in to it. I, in, in my eyes and seeing what's happening. And, and then this year, you know, we had that for the last couple of years and then this year, all of a sudden we've had weather Yeah, and you know, legacy races getting canceled and best and desert races getting canceled for this reason. And, you know, picking like, okay, I have March. I'm going to run the mint right. April. If the truck stays together here, we're going to go run this race because right. it's not. And, and you kind of picked and choose and all of a sudden like, well, this race just got canceled and it's getting pushed back to this month. Well, I'm not going to this race because my son has a karate tournament. Right. And then this race got pushed this month. Well, I'm not going because you know what I said, in January, I'm going to the beach that weekend. And, yeah. and for the first time in 17 years, 
I'm going to go to the beach that weekend. Right. And uh, so it's really changed things up. It's stacked up the end of the 2023 year with a lot of races. And then you guys having, you know, your announcement of running Parker for 2024. If you want to go to the Baja 1000 in, in November, yeah. you're probably not going to make Parker with your best effort because you've got Thanksgiving, you've got Christmas, you've got New Year's. You essentially only have like three working weeks. I know. We need more takes, months. Yeah, we do. <laughs> we need 14 months. Yeah. Because um, all we would do is just stack three more races well, the there, thing, but that's all right. The thing that sucks for us in desert racing is we've got three or four months in the middle of the, in the, middle of the year where it's so miserably hot. And like me personally, I don't want to put on events during that time period because it sucks as a racer. It sucks as a spectator. It sucks as chase crew. You know, yep. it's just like, I love the desert. I don't mind the heat, right? But, you know, when it starts, you know, getting triple digits, just people are not going to come out. Yeah. You know, and there's a lot of people that physically aren't in shape to handle it and don't know how to hydrate correctly. So it gets them, you know, yep. and, and it could be dangerous, right? You very. So it, it's, that's the tough thing about it is like, you know, to, for us, it's like once we start, going over 80 90 degrees then it's like all right you know what i mean <laughs> let's go to the beach you yeah know? yeah so. for sure because i mean at, at the end of the day too we're a lot of us are doing this for fun and and you well, know, I mean, my plan last year at vegas torino was i was not going to run vegas torino this year like i was like i've always wanted to go let's just spend the summer in the mountains in colorado i don't want to be anywhere where it's 100 degrees right but i had such a fun time racing bryce last year that i'm yeah. like Nope, we're going to go back and we're going to make this right. And I'm right. going to be the first one across there the finish line. So that's uh, so that competition, you know, brought us back and, and going back to me kind of, you know, taking this this season off, you know, per se was now I get to enjoy it, though. I get to show up to the race. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, we're going to go out. And we're going to go have fun and, and we're going to put win. your best effort forward. Yep. Right. And, and, you know, the other thing to talk about, too, is equipment and tires. And, you know, now you're you're on BFGs, So, you know, I think that that changes the dynamic a bit you know it, it changes it a lot so it, it's it's interesting because like a lot of really good tire companies and they make really good products but like there's certain things that it comes down to with in particular with 40 inch tires where like you know the the chance of getting a flat you know mitigates really everything you know what i mean and, and the the time splits are so close it's like you know like at the mint it's like you get one flat, you may that may be your race, yep. right? You get multiple flats, that's definitely that your, is race, your race, right? Yeah. And it's just the competition is so stacked and so tight that like, you know, you can't afford any mechanical failures. It's not like the old days where you're like, <laughs> well, we swapped the tranny and then had a beer and a sandwich. We still won the race. It's yep. like that's not happening yeah. anymore, you know. Yeah, and that's every race you can count on someone having, you know, 5, 10, 15 minutes of downtime. I yeah. mean, at the 1000 we count on you know, deal every, the winning truck is going to have an hour, hour downtime. Right. And now you look at it from 21, 22, 23. It's like, nope, you can't have downtime and you got to have, and you got to have a badass right seat guy that can change tires. Yes. Because if flats do happen. It definitely decreases your chances of winning, but there are times that you can luck out and it, everything can go your way and you can get back in and have a big enough you know, dust gap that you can get back out in front of the guy in front of you, but you can't, you, you don't want to put yourself on that chance because every time you stop that truck, there's a chance something happens. Yeah. What took us out of Vegas Torino last year was the jack leg, the, the foot plate on my hydraulic jacks broke. Yeah. And we got our flat in the sand, put the jack down, the Sunk. jack just went in the ground. And, uh, you know, and it, and Mike, we're, you know, he, at that point, got a little, I think, uh, disoriented because we were having such a good race, and we had just gotten back by Bryce, and yeah. and uh, we went out there, and and the manual jack and the truck was froze on, seized on there, you know, for whatever reason, and he couldn't get it off, and you know, next thing you know, we're there for 19 minutes, right? And uh, you know, so you do not want that truck to stop, and yeah. if you, even if, like, hey, here's our here's the optimum pit strategy, you're gonna pit. Four times. Yeah. Well, how do we pit three times? Yeah. Because every time I've, I've parked a truck at Vegas Torino with four fenders on it, 400 miles in the race, perfectly running truck, but the studs seized and or uh, spun in the rear wheel and you couldn't get the wheel off. They, I mean, literally had four good tires on the truck. It's and when you hit the lugs, they would just sit there and spin.
yeah, it's you know the um, the roller coaster of off road racing is one of the wildest in all of motorsports because it's just completely unforgiving. You yeah. know, like you're out, you're in, you're in, yeah. you're out, you're and and then you know it's. I remember there was one of the races I was with them with the McMillans and we had a parts failure. And we're like, well, we're done, right? We're done. And then some random dude walks up and goes, what's wrong? And it was an alternator. And he's all, I have a spare alternator. <laughs> and like, that'll work on this? He's all, oh, yeah. And I'm like, who, who are you? And he's, oh, I own an alternator shop, <laughs> you know, in El Cajon. And he was so happy that he was giving Andy McMillan his, like, alternator. Yeah. Like, I don't even think he ever charged us for it, right? But it's that's the randomness of his like we're all like huh. and so, yeah. oh okay uh, we're, yeah, back we're back in, in it you know what yeah. I mean you we've know, only so. lost twenty minutes yeah we're still and then people break in front of you and you're like we're leaving yeah you know what I mean it's so bonkers it, but it's I think it's one of those things where it's like you know it's the Corky McMillan thing of like never ever ever give up right yep. uh, because you don't you don't know you can't it's really difficult to track what everybody else's races, even with all the modern technology. Right. Um, and then, and, you know, and s some of the, some of the fuckery too, like, uh, you know, like I saw at the 500, uh, there are some of the teams. I'm like, what's that thing on your, it's a jammer. Right. <laughs> and I'm like, Oh, we're, we're on that level now too. Uh. Okay. I'm um, now I'm going to have to put that on the checklist for the men of like, do you have a jammer on your truck? Yeah. Right. And uh, so it's, it's crazy. Um, but it's, but it's also like, you know, when you do get those victories, right. It's, it means something. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely, uh, it definitely does. Especially the longer you are in your career and the more of them you watch slip away. Yeah. I mean, laying underneath the truck at the mint this year was probably the most devastated. I think I've ever been in an off-road race at, at all because it was going so right yeah until it went so wrong so quickly yeah and uh yeah it just it 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 you learn later on in your career to not ever you you learn to celebrate every one of your wins yeah. because you never know when the last one's going to come because you don't know what tomorrow is going to bring yeah. you can be in the seat and you can be out of the seat yep and um yeah so even even when you're in control of your own own team own destiny you don't know what your destiny is because right. you don't know what tomorrow is. A hundred percent. I think it's, it teaches you a lot about life too. You mm -hmm. know, it's like you get it handed to you and you have a choice. Either you can give up, you know, or you can keep going forward, yep. you know, and really when you get over that challenge, you know, and over the mental, you know, the heartbreak of it, the depression or whatever you want to call it. And you go, Hey, look, the reality is there is only one direction and that's forward. Right. Yep. And I think that, you know, that, those beatings in off-road racing really teach you that you're like, Oh man, you know, this isn't shit. I had to spend the night, freeze my ass off. And, and you know, and I was running out of water, you yep. know, and, and you know, people come to you in your business and they're all panicked. Oh, we have a problem. You're like, look, this isn't a real problem, <laughs> right? You know what, I'll yeah. tell you what a real problem is. Real yeah. problem is being broken down in the middle of Baja with no communication. You're going to spend the night, you're freezing, you know, you're running out of water and you know, whatever. And you, but you didn't die. Yeah, and you, put, and you learn how to put it together and know that it will come together because one, you didn't panic. Yeah. Or you shouldn't have panicked if you did panic, and and you have, and then that's when you learn to trust your, you know, call them employees, your volunteers, your friends, your yep. family that you have around you that they're not going to leave leave you there, right? Or you having that problem in business, you have other people that you can rely on, and they're not going to leave you in that situation that you're in, or or that problem that there is, and it's just really just making sure you have the right group of people around you in the core. And a you know a solid core, and uh, yeah, it's what it takes. I mean, off road racing is a lot like life, and I and relate it back to like sports. If if anyone out there watches you know NHL, you can see a goal happen three plays before. Off road racing and pit strategy, you can see a problem coming down the road when things start you know when things start going off the rails. So it's a um, it's a wild it's a wild wild sport, and even if it's just in a 16 mile little loop a lot of stuff can go a lot of stuff can change and a lot of stuff can go wrong in off-road racing 100 percent. you know mike kim from fox rides with you right what like what led you to that decision because 
there was a, a lot of stuff. I mean, <laughs> uh, Derek had been Derek's been riding with me since 2014, and uh, obviously, it's a lot. He also is the one that preps the truck. He works for us full time, and it's a lot to prep a truck, ride in the truck, and you know, put a lot of the of race gear together, and you know, put all that together. So. When we got the all-wheel yeah, drive there's truck. there's no sleep in that job. <laughs> Especially then you got to have, you have kids outside of it and you got volleyball and you got dance and you got this and you got that. So um, it's going back to, you know, the balance and he just felt like he wasn't able to give everything he can give to go out and run against these guys. So, uh, you know, there was about a six month period that was like, I don't really have a navigator for next year, but I'm not really too worried about it because something's going to come along. And uh, obviously me driving the Fox truck and, and being as close with those guys, uh, Mike Kim's program was changing for him too. And it was kind of worked like, well, Mike's available. You have live valve on your truck. He develops it. He's a shock tuner, Fox truck. Like it just all kind of led to it's put, you know, Mike's going in the right seat with me. And, and, um, you know, I, like anything, it took a race or two for us to understand each other's notes and that, but, um, you know, it's, it was last year. We had a lot of fun together. He hasn't ridden with me yet this year um, because he well actually he did at the mint, uh, and uh, we were really clicking there. That's when it you know it all came together. And I think at one time we had 18 minutes on the next truck physically, yeah. and uh, just out there nailing it. And uh, you know had our driveline problem, and ultimately our throttle body pro problem. But um, you know, look forward to how next year plays out in races. And, and uh, he's riding with Christopher Pavardi this year down in Baja. So I've had uh, two different navigators down there, one being uh, Dustin Orth with uh, Oligus, and then Derek got back in the truck with me for the 500. So, nice. um, you know, I've really put my program around not having, you know, really having one sole navigator um, anymore because I just haven't been able to make the commitment. On yeah. what races I'm doing. So. Yeah, well, I mean, Mike Kim's really unique in that, you know, he, he is the engineer at Fox that developed that live valve system, right? And, you know, along with, with Bobby and the rest of the team. But, like, it's really, really cool from a technology standpoint that, one, you allowed it. That, two, Mike Kim made the commitment because he's he's no slouch, right? Nope. He's not in there just kind of like, hey, hand me my <laughs> latte, right? Yeah. Like, and he's not a big dude. So that was one of the things when he told me this, I'm like, I'm like, have you ever lifted a 40 inch tire? Cause I have, and they're not, they're not yeah. light. Right. Yeah. I'm like, you're, I'm like, how many more inches taller are you than 40 <laughs> inches? You know? And, and I love the guy, but yeah, I was kind of like, you know, when, as tire sizes, you know, grew, I'm like, you need a, you know, pretty strong dude to, you know, do those tire changes because you got to get the tire off. You got to get it back on the rack. You got to get one off the rack. So it's it's a lot of movements. It's not like, um, you By know, the way, you got to do it with a helmet on. Yes. Strapped in. Yeah. And after you've had the absolute shit beat out of you yes. for either the first five minutes of the race or 500 miles into the race. Yeah. You're kind of all stoved up and stiff and you got to get out and you're like, in 30 seconds, you got a driver yelling at you like, what are you doing back there? Yeah. Yeah, so. exactly. But it, but it's also like, it's interesting because I don't think, you know, I don't think there's any other form of racing that has a, you know, a, a co-writer, you know, from the company that's making the product riding in the, in the car at, at a top level. Yeah. Like I've seen, I've seen some things in rally where it's like, Oh, you know, so-and-so from this company is, you know, racing and he's in the way in the back you know, then, and, you know, it's for the spring company, and, yep. you know, or whatever it is. Right. And I'm like, Oh, that's really cool. Right. But when, when I saw that, that happen and, you know, I, I was really, um, I was really impressed. And it's one of those things I love talking about the technology that comes from off-road racing and, and how it is created. And, you know, the live valve system, you know, is going to continue to evolve and get better, which will, you know, translate to higher speeds and more car control. And I'm pretty excited about what that brings. Yeah, for sure. And what's really like, as we kind of progress to levels, the live valve system was actually developed for the trophy trucks before it was ever developed for the OEM market. Right. But there wasn't the money in the off-road world to actually develop it. So then it was like, well, let's take this idea and this concept and, and what the prototype parts are built 
and let's sell it to the OEM side so then we can get the money that it generates and yeah. then now we can make it, you know, for a trophy truck. And well, I mean, I could tell you, like, I, I test drove one of the Bronco Raptors and I took it out to Octeo and beat the piss out of it, right? And that has live valve on it. And I was thoroughly impressed. I, that is probably, no, that is the most impressive, you know, OEM off-road vehicle I've ever driven, you know? in terms of something that is street legal and then you can just take it into the dirt. Right. Yep. And a big part of that is the suspension. Right. And, and two, how the, you know, engine suspension, all the tuning and everything works together and you can switch modes. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, you know, does we'll, it really do anything? Yeah. We'll see. Yep. Ha, ha ha ha. You have Baja mode. It's badass, Yep. Right. And, and it, and it, you know, I'm really proud that that, completely derived from trophy truck racing yeah you know what i mean like that's that's a pretty badass story to be like hey we developed that. <laughs> we developed it we got your money and then we're making it even better now <laughs> exactly so, no it's it's really cool to have on the truck it definitely adds um you know i think have a little bit of advantage and if not just another tu tuning tool and um you know it was really cool back when i got the very first win at blue water w with fury and uh, it was one it was the first live valve win and of course, running that that short loop, I think it was like 28 miles or something like that. Did right. it four times over two days. As the course got rougher, I was able to drive the truck harder, and my lap times actually sped up instead of slowed down over a rougher course. And it was all because I knew I could fly into the next hole and the truck would catch me. Right. And uh, you know, that's all part of the you know active learning of of the system. And uh, no, it's really cool, and it's it's cool to have it on the truck and it's really cool to have the guy that knows exactly how to work it sitting right seat and go well, oh let's go to mode two let's go to mode three it, it's it's interesting because it's going to allow for better performances like we saw with lauren healy and his leap of faith mm -hmm. you know at king of the hammers it was like hey if uh that truck didn't have live valve on it he likely would have had a broken back yeah you know what i mean like if, for people who don't know like lauren healy at king of the hammers Took a line and basically chucked his <laughs> chucked his car off of a cliff. Yeah, and and uh, you know and and landed and kept going and every it was it was that was a holy shit moment. Yeah, it was and impressive. That clip is everywhere online and it, it's really cool and funny because uh, um, it the leap of faith uh, moniker came from the skateboarding trick that Jamie Thomas did, you know, years ago. Uh, you know, more or less like jumping down in this massive set of stairs right <laughs> and uh i'm pretty sure his knees are suffering because yeah. <laughs> that he did not have live valve yeah. right so but again it's it's cool to see that the theory you know come you know come from off-road racing a product get created it actually works right and then yeah. it gets put into all these oem vehicles like the the razors the all the utvs right yep. kawasaki has one now uh, uh can am has one it's i don't think it's on a jeep yet i'm not uh, sure there i think the jeep gladiator has has one or there's an option or i know there's something out there for jeep well jeep jeep needs to get yeah. it on that because it would definitely improve the ride i know it's on the raptor i know it's on the the bronco so and i think i'm not sure if they're doing it now on the new tacoma uh, I'm pretty sure there's yeah. an option on there too. So yeah, and you got the Ranger Raptor. And... Yeah, the Ranger Raptor, which is badass too. I yep. haven't driven one of those, but it's like I have this list, and I, <laughs> I keep talking to the OEMs. I'm like, I need you to send me this, yeah, and this and this because I, I I wanna I wanna feel it and understand it so that when people ask me about it, I can give I them can, an educated experience. Yeah, I can talk about it honestly yeah. and say, yeah, you know, that's not really you know the vehicle you know, blah, 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 blah. But, you know, Ford in particular with their development of the Raptor has done a really good job of building a package that works mm -hmm. together. And, you know, um, you can go get an aftermarket kit and maybe get a little bit more travel, but it's not going to work with the entire, you know, computer system, the drive, drivetrain system, all that, like a, you know, like a Bronco or a Raptor do. So, it's really cool to see that technology, you know, go out, and especially because like that all came from marking. And I know yep. both you and I had a had a really good relationship with marking, so it's it's cool to see that live on. Yeah, it definitely is. And uh, said I'm very fortunate to get a, to drive the truck and and really be the one that's getting a lot of that um, 
you know, being able to experience it first and before anyone else. Yeah. Well, hey, I really appreciate the time, man. Go go do karate yeah. and go do uh, uh, horse showing with your family. Yep. And, uh, you know, we'll be seeing each other soon in the dirt. Sounds good. Thank right, you. Thanks for Appreciate that. it.